Okay, I think we're live now. Um, hello everyone and welcome to the third and final lecture for our spring 2022 MA Aesthetics and Politics, Politics lecture series. My name's Amanda Beach and I'm the Dean of the School of Critical Studies and also faculty on the MA Aesthetics and Politics program where this series is a part of our curriculum. First, I'd like to thank everyone uh, out there and in here for being here, our speakers, you the audience, as well as our valued people in technical support who have been with us throughout the series and making everything happen on the back end. Um, I hope, as with the rest of the talks, you'll find this series um, thought provoking and to remind you that there is um, a chat to the right of the screen um, and you can add in any questions, any thoughts, and I'm gonna be mediating those back to the speakers as we go forward. So please do get involved and ask your questions. Um, the format for the series has been three sets of talks, each fe featuring one main speaker and a respondent. And today I have great pleasure in welcoming Professor Tony Bowes and Professor James Trafford as his respondent. Each semester we explore a different topic and this spring, we have been discussing the big theme of dominance and revolution with the subtitle, The Image, the Struggle and the Use of Force. Themes of dominance and revolution are not so popular today. The idea of a comprehensive reorient reorientation of our world is claimed to be impossible. And the notion that there is a visible concentration of power that might be called dominant has been eviscerated by neoliberal global capital, but also somewhat by the disaggregating mechanics of critical theory, which have preferred to speak about horizontal forms of power as opposed to verticality. In such case, even though the question of our social and political future has been described as open, it remains limited. In other words, despite that we are told that there are no grounds, no givens, no truth, and that this seems to hold the promise of open possibilities, these possibilities have not established any significant freedoms from the conventions and habits that define the condition of capitalism and within it, structures of race, class and power. In this series, we explore the possibility of theorizing, thinking and picturing the relations of the past, present and the future, but through a constructive lens. In our last session, just to remind everyone, um, Jean Marino explored the com complex history of revolutionary art and revolutionary politics, focusing on the work of Juan Francisco Elso. His talk dealt with the antagonisms inside the Cuban revolutionary process, as it sought to rectify and realign its politics with the dreams that had acted as the revolution's original inspiration. Citing this tension between this act of thinking and doing, and the force that is required to unify the abstract idea, to empirical forms of practice in everyday life. Jalai Monsal's response took this question up directly by asking how the possibility of agency dreams of social and political change can be prosecuted without the totalization of force over others. This undergirded her curiosity regarding the claims that various Cuban artists of this 1980s generation were already working in the vein of decolonizing critiques and practices manifesting a form of critique that had yet to be named. So both presentations brought us to the urgent and difficult questions regarding the ways in which critical cultural works obtain an out of jointness. That is, they demonstrate and reinscribe the dissonance of the impossibility of equality between idea and form, people and people, and at the same time, the impossibility of being unequal to that time. So today, we will continue to look at how artworks navigate and contend with normative and conventional forms of power that support the art world, but also act as part of its own infrastructure of critique. Here, um, I've got great pleasure in inviting Tony Bogues to speak on art and art history, reframing aesthetics and politics, a reflection on Haitian art. And, um, Dr. Anthony Bogues is a writer, scholar, and curator. He has published nine books in the fields of political thought and critical theory, Caribbean intellectual history, and Caribbean art. He is currently working on a book titled Black Critique, 
and a book Sonic Project on politics and music in Jamaica during the 1970s. He is co-editing some of the unpublished writings of Sylvia Winter, another volume titled Race, Slavery, Capitalism and the Making of the Modern World, as well as the biography of the Haitian artist André Pierre. He is the Asa Mesa Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory, Professor of Africana Studies and Affiliated Professor in the Department of the History of Art and Architecture at Brown University in the USA. Bogues has curated and co-curated art shows in the Caribbean, South Africa, Paris and the USA. Currently, he is the co-convener of two major historical art and cultural projects in Slavery's Wake with the National African American Museum of History and Culture and the project Imagined New Black Life After Historical Catastrophe in South Africa. His respondent is Dr. James Trafford, who was reader in philosophy and design at the University for the Creative Arts in London in the UK. They are the author of Empire at Home, International Colonies and the End of Britain, um, which came out in 2020, and Meaning in Dialogue, which came out in 2017, as well as co-editor of Alien Vectors, that's from Routledge 2019, and Speculative Aesthetics, MIT 2016. They are involved in immigrant detainee support, organizing against border imperialism, and a large-scale class composition project with the collective notes from below. So with that, I'm so pleased to welcome um, Tony Bogues to start our talk today and also James Trafford to um, come as respondent following him. So with that, I welcome you both and thank you, Tony, so much for being here. Uh, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Professor Beach, for inviting me to, uh, to, to be the speaker in this um, series. And from what you have said, the series has turned out to be something significant on, on your campus. Uh, this talk is a reflective one. It is a reflective one in, on three things. The question of history, the question of politics, and the questions of aesthetics. I reflect about these three specific subjects uh, through a line of thinking which engages Haitian art and my own work as a curator and writer around this particular field. In doing that, I'm doing this reflection, I want to begin with the conventional framing of Haitian art. The conventional framing or framings of Haitian art usually and typically considers Haitian art as naive, as a form of primitivism, as a folk art in a cultural anthropological sense. No matter what the different schools of Haitian art are, the historical school which comes out of Cap Haitian in the North or the school of beauty, or the school of San Suel, critics and art historians describe all production of Haitian art without understanding what schools they may come from. That is what are the internal dynamics that produce these forms of art and art practices and essentially label them as just primarily primitive. I think that is important to understand though, where this notion of primitivism comes from and how the notion of primitivism emerges to frame Haitian art. If we go back a bit to the 1930s and 40s in Paris, we would see a, we would encounter rather than see, we would encounter a series of colonial markets in Paris. Visitors to that, that market included many French artists, but two in particular are of significance to what I'm going to say. And the two are Picasso and Henri Matisse. In fact, it was Matisse who encouraged Picasso 
to visit the markets. In these colonial markets, there were African masks and sculpture. We know that many of these objects had religious value. But now in this market, the colonial market in Paris, they were extracted from their context. And uh, they were just seen as objects, objects to be used in whatever way one wanted to use them. What is interesting is how some writers and critics have talked about the ways in which uh, both Matisse and Picasso, as well as other French artists at the time, have take the, took up some of these um, masks, some of these sculptures, and indeed, particularly for Matisse, take, took up the color of blue as part of some of what was seen in the colonial market, particularly with uh, artifacts from North Africa. The critics have argued that this is a kind of Africanism and that with this Africanism, they argue that what then happened was the creation of the word of primitivism as a kind of category to think about art. But then they do a twist. They argue that this primitivism becomes a form of modernism. And uh, as it becomes a form of modernism, it undermines the French establishment art itself. And as one, in the words of, in words of one critic, this primitivism, which undermines modernism, becomes, and here I quote the critic, an avant-garde gesture. Other critics have argued that the work of Picasso himself is that of expropriation a kind of colonial extractive artistic practice. And I saw an exhibition at the Quay Branley in 2017 around Picasso work in which there was a juxtaposition between his work that was clearly influenced by African art and the, the juxtapose and place beside some of the work itself with the artist now named. And what is clear to, uh, to many of us who saw this and the reviewers, some of the reviewers who wrote on this particular exhibition was that there were ways in which you cannot think about certain pieces of Picasso without not thinking about African art. And that Picasso's own statement when asked about what, how does Negro art, the interviewer asked him, influence his work, he's equipped, I, I don't know it, meaning I don't know Negro art. Now, there are many ways to read this particular point. We can, we can read it as, okay, he, there's for him, the Negro and the way in which people are thinking about the Negro was not a way in which he thought about Black art. That's a favorable reading. Or we can read it as a form of disavowal. That is, the not, he would not um, pay, a, he would not recognize the influence of Black art upon his own work or of African art on his own work. What I think is important though, is to understand that in the discussion about primitivism, that it moved quickly from a gesture of avant-garde to be on from in and to describe in the work of people like the Cobra Group from Amsterdam, Brussels, and Copenhagen, and instead became very popular in the post-imperial Europe as a form of cultural anthropological description of backwardness of of sort sort of sort of, sort of primitive persons of people not yet quite human. In this sense, therefore, primitivism does not mean modernism, but that primitivism, particularly as it then was used to describe Haitian art, and in which emerged in the 1940s, when primitivism becomes this cultural anthropological word, then also begins to mean a certain kind of way of thinking 
about Haitian art as quote unquote backward and something not quite yet reaching the level of civilization. One of the first books on Haitian art is a 1948 book written by an American critic and writer, Selden Rodman, who also wrote extensively on Mexican art. And in his 1948 book called Renaissance in Haiti, popular painters in, in Haiti, in the, in the Black Republic, he notes that there is an absence, he says, of African cultural forms in Haitian culture. And he draws this particular conclu conclusion from the work of the cultural anthropologist Herskovitz's book, The Life in a Haitian Valley, which was published in 38. What was, I think, important in that particular line of Herskovitz, that there was an absence of African cultural forms in Haitian culture, was that he was then reflecting on certain idea of sculpture being a certain form of art and a certain important form of art of quote unquote, cultured and civilized people, but making the point that it was how absent it was in, in Haiti. And what he wants to, to make the point, another point I think he wanted to make was that the Haiti, which was then known, known as Little Dahomey at that point in time, did not did ha actually had the absence of certain African cultural forms. This is an actually contradistinction to a whole set of uh, cultural literature and uh, cultural investigations about Haiti, which pointed to its Africanness in the new world. Rodman suggests in his, uh, in his discussion of Haitian uh, art that there are two forms of Haitian art, he says. There's what he calls popular realism and religious art. And he notes essentially that, however, that both popular realism and religious art, he says, belongs to the category of the primitive. He spent some time in this particular work thinking and, and writing around the work of Hector Hippolyte, perhaps one of the most important Haitian artists in the 1940s. And this is what he says about Hippolyte. And here I quote Rodman. Unlike any other of the Haitian primitives, Rodman says, Hippolyte makes no if effort to achieve a realistic effect in his pictures. If he ever went in for precise modeling details, he continues, he has abandoned it. It would be unfair, Rodman says, to say that his powers of observation are not good because intent, his intentions so obviously are in the direction of expressionist fantasy, end of quote. By calling the leading, leading Haitian artists in the 1940s primitive, Rodman began a categorization which today has shifted from primitive to the current nomenclature of self thought artists. What was interesting to me is how, particularly in a period of black power and in the 1960s and 1970s and so on, that you begin to get a ways in which people were trying to shift from primitive and find what I would call a kind of better, a nicer way to call these particular artists. And this is not only in Haiti, quite frankly, this is in the Caribbean because it is in Jamaica that the phrase self-taught artist emerges in, to describe particular artists who have not had formal academic training and whose artwork were previously called naive or folklore or indeed uh, primitive. I would want to suggest to you, however, that to think about Haitian art and its history requires us to move away from some of the former categories of Western art and to grapple with the art and the practices of the art itself. In this regard, the conventional art, historic, art historical perspective, which constructs art into two distinct realms of the political, in quotation marks, and aesthetic, are porous in Haitian art. 
Jacques Rancière notes that the politics and aesthetics, Rancière says, are ways of doing and making that intervene in the general distribution of ways of doing, doing and making. And that these maintain forms and beings of modes of visibility. It is not in my view that these two practices are the same. That is that artistic practices and political practices are the same. But what I would want to suggest is that the chasm which has been opened up between them in our theoretical formulations are not tenable in Haitian art. But I would also argue tenable in radical art in general. In the 1940s, prior to, just prior before Rodman's book in 1948, but in 1945, Andre Breton, the quote unquote founder of surrealism, visits Haiti. And he visits Haiti because we have to then begin to understand the Francophone Caribbean, which includes Haiti, even though it was independent, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and French Guyana. And in this visit, he gives a talk to 600 Haitians, an audience of 600 people in Port-au-Prince on, on surrealism. And this is what he says. He says, if I had seen the work of Hippolyte and others before we did surrealism, I would not have actually gone in a surrealist direction. That's what this speech says. What is interesting is that the translation of the speech, which has become uh, very important in discussions of Haitian art, says that Breton says that Haitian art is surrealist art. And so one of the things that you begin to get in, in progressive circles, particularly in the 1970s, is that people don't call Haitian art naive or primitive or folk or even intuitive or, or, or self-made artists, but begin to say Haitian art is surrealist. And I'm always amazed at the, at the, as, a, as, a, as a scholar, because when I read Breton's speech, that's not what he says when you translate it. But a slip in translation then creates a particular category in which people now think about, um, think about Haitian, in which you think about Haitian art. I think though that is important to note that Breton's work around Haitian art though, is important because it is Breton who brings Hector Hippolyte to the UNESCO International Art Exhibition in 1947. And this is what Breton himself says about Hippolyte's work. He says, it is work that is here, I quote him, entirely, and entirely ringing as a as virgin method, method, he says. And he also makes the point, and that quite frankly, that this kind of work is so important that it opens up a space for, for art, for us to think about art itself. But I would also want to suggest to you that what we are looking at in trying to think about this question of the categories of Haitian art is that it's important to understand it within a specific kind of discursive context. And that, this, that discursive context is what I call the imperial archive of the idea of Haiti itself. This particular imperial archive of the idea of Haiti itself constructs Haiti primarily as a site of chaos, as a site of never ending catastrophic events from the slave revolution of 1791 to the more recent earthquake. It is a dominant Western archive which creates Haiti as a fixed sign marked by a strange, and fun, a, strange, a strange kind of otherness which cannot be understood, and also a kind of place in which quote unquote black magic hap happens. In dismantling these frames, we begin to understand Haitian art in the words of Edward Bisson as a, as a vocation, as a vocation of refusal. 
This end of quote, this refusal, in my view, shapes both the process, the processes of contestation within the making of art and the art itself. And it actually happens on a terrain of the popular. And where I understand the popular and how the popular is structured, I really draw here from Stuart Hall, who makes the point that the popular can, should be understood as a tension between what belongs to the central dominant and the elite and the culture and practices, he says, of the periphery. That is the folks who are outside of the elite. Within this kind of framework, I want to talk about trying to think through Haitian art on its own terms and thinking through both a certain kind of literature and culture about Haiti in the 1930s and 40s, which then allows us to begin to try and develop categories along with Haitian thinkers as to how they see Haitian art. Modernism, as we know, is essentially thinks about questions of change through a certain gaze upon new subjects. And within this kind of thinking, the popular is, is contingent and generative of new forms. When Andre Breton observed that if young French art artists had known of Hippolyte, he alone could have changed the course of French painting. I think he was pointing to something that we should note, that Hippolyte's work fundamentally challenged modern art. And so the question that we want to pose is, uh, in this essay, is real, or in this talk, is uh, what is this category that may help us to understand and that may undermine the ways in which we think Haitian, in ways in which Haitian art is thought and understood in the Western art tradition. To do this, I make, I present to you in this particular audience, a remarkable essay by a Haitian doctor, as well as a writer, a novelist, a person who was murdered by the Duvalier regime because he attempted to develop a guerrilla movement in the 1960s. And in, his name is Stephen Alexis. And at 19, 1956 in Paris, at perhaps one of the most important intellectual cultural conferences of the 20th century, black intellectual cultural conferences of the century, held at the Sorbonne, the 1956 Congress of Black, black Writers, Stephen Alexis gives a talk. There's a conference in which George Lamin from Barbados speaks, those of you who know Afro-Caribbean um, literature. It is a conference in which Richard Wright is a special speaker, is a guest speaker, for those of you who know African-American uh, African literature. It is, a, it is a conference in which Fanon speaks and then gets angry and walks out. This is a conference in which Leopold Senghor is a, is a major speaker. It's a conference in which James Baldwin speaks. It's a conference in which Amy Cesar speaks. So if you look at all the central figures of the mid 20th century, black cultural life, novelists and artists, you will see that they, were, they attended that particular conference. And so it is a seminal event in my view, in thinking around, of, of thinking around black culture, black art and black, black thought in general. So Alexis gets up and gives this speech on the marvelous realism of the Haitians. And in this particular talk, what he argues is the following. Firstly, that Negro art, and he uses that phrase, was fundamentally linked to life, he, he argues. And he argues that in its, in its fundamental link to life, it has a form of humanism which traverses, Alexis argues, history, mysticism, and naturalism. This realism, he argues, in Haitian art contains, and here I'm quoting him, it's a very long quote, contains order, beauty, logic, and controlled sensitivityness, which presents the real, which is accompaniment of the strange and the fantastic of dreams and half light of the mysterious and the marvelous. 
Hessian art, he continues, seems to be looking for a type, but the way it deals with the types is actual in the Latin sense of the word actualis, that which acts. So actual that all particularized subjects can be found in it. This art is that of the, is the characteristic moments of life, but it summarizes the real in its, entirely in, its, in its entirety. Imagination reigns here as mistress and refashions the world of its own guides. I think that what Alexis is saying is that, that the actual form in which Haitian art presents itself, the compositional form in which it presents itself is, can be seen around this business of, of uh, what is marvelous, what he calls the marvelous. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But that within this marvelous, he would want to argue, is the real. And I think that what is important is for us to just think a bit about what that means. This particular understanding of the marvelous is in deep conversation with literature and particularly in conversation with the work of Algier Carpentier, who wrote this book, The Kingdom of This World, published in 1949. What is interesting is that this book is on the Haitian Revolution. And in this particular text, the hero, if you want to call it, use that word, is not, not Dessaline, is not Toussaint Louverture. The hero is actually Mackendall. And Mackendall is a, considered a voodoo priest who wanted to, who developed a political strategy and program of poisoning for the planters. And whose ambition, political ambition and objective was to poison the entire planter class and to set up a black revolt, black republic. And what is interesting is that Mackendall was a voodoo priest. And part of his skill as a voodoo priest was his understanding of plants and how to use herbs as poisoning. Ironically, he was hurt in a particular accident on the plantation, but was allowed to stay on the plantation by his masters because of his knowledge of herbs. He would use those knowledge as med medical knowledge for the planters themselves. So there was a real ironic set of stories, which I always find amusing, which is that the planters were being poisoned by Mackinder. And then he would call, the, the planters would then call him, call him in to, to deal with the actual poison. Because, so, so he was considered this particular, this, particular, um, can't, this particular healer. And so I think that to, to begin to understand some of what uh, uh, Alexis is, is trying to get at is that they, all of these things which are seen to operate at a, uh, particularly at a religious symbolic order, which I will come to, have a certain root in a certain reality. And that in that reality, that what you get, I would argue, is a certain kind of, is a certain kind of politics and a conception of history itself. Alexis then, as I said, calls Haitian art, marvelous realism. And as I said, he is drawing the word, the phrase from the work of Algier Carpentier. And parenthetically, I think one of the fascinating things, if you think about um, ethnic, you know, the ways in which ideas and words travel, is that quick, is that by the 1960s and so on, marvelous realism is turned into mag magical realism in Latin America. Um, and the work of people like Gabriel Marquez and so on. Um, and, and, and later on, um, the, um, you know, uh, Allende. Um, but the, it, the, in, the, in, the centrality of that, of it in the 1940s and early 50s, I would argue, in Paris, in a set of conversations, a Caribbean set of conversations between Cubans and between Haitians is important. The other important figure in, in, in this is, an, is, a, is, a, is the actual, is the wife of Amy Cesaire who gets left out in all of these discussions. Because while this discussion is going on in Paris around marvelous realism, she in Martinique is, is editing a journal called Tropiques and she's writing about what the marvelous is. And so that for her, the marvelous becomes a, a way in which she says uh, 
Mis the mysterious becomes real. The marvelous is against what she calls miserabilism. That is a certain kind of ways in which uh, people portray the, uh, the, the, the people of Martinique as uh, in particular the French, uh, French poets and, and French uh, artists would portray uh, Martinicans and Guadalupeans in a certain way. And she calls that miserabilism and says, the marvelous is about a different kind of portrayal. It's about trying to get under the surface of these particular, um, of, of our particular, of the ways in which the European gaze would try, would see these particular islands. So that this business of marvelous and the marvelous realism, I would want to argue, emerges um, and becomes a, an, as a, an aesthetic frame, a category for us to begin to think about Haitian art. But it also has another history which we tend to forget. And that is the history of what then is going on inside Haiti itself. And that what is going on in, inside Haiti itself is important in the following ways. Firstly, there's the American occupation between 1915 to 1935. But secondly, and this I think is perhaps most important, there is the emergence of a particular text by a man called Jean Priest Mars, who was also at the 56th conference. And the text is called So Spoke Uncle. The key element of that text is an argument, two sets of elements or two arguments. One, that Haiti is an African society. Two, that the cultural practices of the Haitian peasant and of the ordinary Haitian is in fact African and a kind of Afro-Caribbean. He describes later on that what you have is a certain kind of indigenousness, that around for of blackness, indigenous blackness, which emerges, which he argues for against the kind of racist occupation of, of, of American imperial occupation. The Haitian art critic, Michel Philippe Labors, has called this all of um, uh, Jean Priest Mars' work and all that happened around that time, a moment of indigenous revolt. Importantly, one of the leading Haitian artists, Petion Savan, argues in that at the moment of that quote unquote revolt, and establishes a manifesto about Haitian art and a review, which he calls the indigenous review, which argues that what he is trying to do or what he and his group will try to do is to develop, and here I quote Petion Savant, most modern techniques and to try and adapt these modern techniques to demands of Haitian art. Central though, to this, to this indigenous um, revolt was the was voodoo itself and the, uh, and the practice of voodoo. Voodoo, I would argue, is a symbolic order created by racial slavery and French colonialism, and that it systematizes itself as a system of thought and practice, not just religion, but as a system of thought and practice during the Haitian Revolution, and we can talk about that if you wish. As a symbolic order and religious practice, it has navigated, in, or it's it has been created rather from various sources, a combination of African religions, particularly from West Africa and the Congo, and also a version of French Catholicism. But it is a set of religious and, and symbolic order that is born out of the historical catastrophe, uh, catastrophe conditions of the African experience in the new world. Voodoo is rich with its panoply of gods, of spirits, of laws, L-W-A-Y-S, and, al and, and alive with a sense of the marvelous. And that many artists therefore have begun, have not have begun, draw from that source. And what is interesting is that Hippolyte, for example, becomes was one of the, was not just a painter, but was was said to, said to himself uh, or proclaimed himself a voodoo priest. But voodoo 
is uh, with this rich symbolic order, which is an alternative to the, colon to the coloniality of racial slavery and French colonialism, also becomes critical in understand in, as, as, a, as a way in which art practices begin to develop in, uh, in Haiti, in I would argue from the in the in the, in the 20th, uh, early 20th century. And if you could put image one on the screen, I would appreciate it. Can't remember who's doing this. Um, Moham, yeah, are you there to do image one? Yeah, thank you very much. No, the first one. Yep, that's it. This particular image is by a Haitian artist called Andre Pierre, who one day, if I am able to, um, I hope to write a biography of. And this particular image is, is the, the uh, painting has, you know, is, is titled The Guinean Spirits Returning to Africa After the Haitian Independence War. Now there are a whole host of things there and we could spend hours going through this, but I want, we don't have enough time. So I just want to lightly touch on some of, some of the things around this painting. One, the first thing I'd want you to, 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 to note is the, the, the dress of the, the, the soldiers. And these soldiers are actually um, uh, laws, spirits within the African pantheon of uh, voodoo. And that they are on a cloud, um, which is really is about a ship. Um, so there's a re reorganizing of the slave ship itself or reimagining of the ship, slave ship itself. And they are on their way back to Africa. What is important, I think, about this is the following. One is that the Guinean spirits are understood as African spirits. And Guinea, within the cosmology of voodoo and within black cosmology, new world cosmology, is a kind of placeholder or a name placeholder for, 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 for the continent of Africa itself. So it's interesting to me that he's talking about the Guinean spirits. Secondly, that is important, is interesting that he's saying that they are returning to Africa, but they're returning to Africa after, doing, after playing a part in the Haitian independence war, not in the war against slavery, which means that in, the, in Haiti, you, you, one has to understand that they are the moment of the Haitian Revolution has two uh, the Haitian Revolution has two moments to it. it is what I call the dual revolution. The first moment is the ending of slavery led by Toussaint Louverture, and then the second moment is the 1804-1805 victory of the Jacques Dessalines when he gets rid of the French and fights a national bitter national liberation war to achieve Haitian independence. What is interesting, therefore, is that this particular image and drawing of uh, uh, Andre Pierre is not about the ending of slavery, but it is about the proclamation of independence. And, the, and that he sees the revolution as primarily um, the war for independence. What then I think becomes important in thinking about this is that who are the people who fought in this war independence? What help did they need? Um, who facilitated the victory of the revolutionaries, uh, ex-slaves, in what was then known as the indigenous army, which is what Dessalines called the ex-slaves army, um, to, to, over, to, get, to get rid of the French and to, and to successfully struggle for political uh, independence, making Haiti or transforming the colony of saint Domingue into the first black republic of the new world, um, that is Haiti. The story I'm trying to tell here, therefore, is the centrality, and because uh, uh, Andre Pierre is a voodoo priest, is the centrality of voodoo to the symbolic order and imaginary of the, even of the revolution itself. And that the, one of the most important Haitian painters, Andre Pierre, can think about the Haitian revolution and the war of independence, not in the kind of conventional political terms, that we can we to be would think about the revolution, but to think about the ways in which a law, the laws will pay, will laws pay attention. 
or the low, role at the lowest play. So what I would then want to suggest that voodoo becomes a particular practice, which is central to the revolution. And uh, you know, we can discuss this and we can talk about voodoo songs and other voodoo um, images and so on, or other voodoo or other paintings and, and artistic practices that are influenced by voodoo. But it is also a certain kind of engagement with history. There are many paintings of the inauguration of the revolution in 1791, the 1st of August at a place called Boys Common in the north of Haiti. In fact, one of the most popular um, uh, uh, paintings, a uh, uh, series of paintings, if you want to use that phrase, of Haiti is the start, is the inauguration of the revolution. And it therefore is the inauguration of the revolution which would plays an important role. And so that it, and therefore, if it does, then there's a kind of popular imaginary, which is constructed in the art of Haiti that thinks about how the revolution happened and who made, who made the revolution. So what is also, I think, important is to understand that how this particular, how the uh, voodoo and the Haitian revolution together provide as inaugural events um, an origin and origin on events which opens up for different spaces really provide a rich source of thinking about Haitian art. Now, one of the difficulties in the categories of Haitian art is that people think it's just Haitian art is just voodoo. Can I look at the second image, please? But I or, or just primarily influenced by voodoo. <clears throat> and I want to just show you a, a, a um, a piece that some of us think is perhaps one of the most significant artist, art, um, pieces in Haitian art history. In the middle of the American occupation, a group of guerrillas called CACOS, C-A-C-O-S, led by this man called Prelate, began to struggle against the occupation. They were doing their successful, they were kind of up and down, successful today, not so, so, not so successful tomorrow. But clearly he was an, this fellow prelate was an inspirational leader. What the Marines did was they, they through a set of substitutes is that they, they captured him, murdered him, put his body on the door, then took a picture so the importance of photographs at that time in the 19th, in the mid, beginning of the 20, early part of the 20th century, and then dropped from helicopters all over Haiti, the picture of him on the, you know, uh, uh, to all the districts that they could find. This particular artist, Philomé Oban, gets who is not a Buddhist priest, who's actually a Baptist by religion, gets, picks up one of these pictures um, and for photographs and then paints this particular image called the crucifixion of, um, of, of a prelate. This is remarkable because one of the things that uh, Auburn wants to do, and he says it in his, in his work and his various um, letters and so on, is that he wanted to pay, do a history of Haiti. And he wanted, he said, to do a history of Haiti that would not be words, that is literature, but it would be a history of Haiti that is deeply rooted in the popular imaginary and in the, and in the visual of, 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 of Haiti. And so that what you are getting, and this is outside the symbolic order um, of voodoo, is that you are now getting, again, a preoccupation with history. But it is a preoccupation with history from the Haitian point of view, and, 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 and a, sort of a way in which they one day would then turn around as uh, figures from being, uh, you know, uh, terrorists as they were being called at, from uh, that point, at that from that point to actually martyrs, uh, uh, martyrs in of, of the in, in the country. So the crucifixion is about as you know is a certain martyrdom. And there he has two images of this. He has a, a second image in which he has his um, uh, prelate's mother crying, but she's actually dressed in the colors of the, of the, Haitian, uh, of the Haitian flag. 
So that, what is the point here I am making with these two things, two images? The point I'm making here is that the questions of history emerge very forcefully in, in Haitian art. And that if there's an aesthetic there, or which, I would come to, which we call marvelous realism, that part of those aesthetic practices are to think through uh, historical, uh, historical uh, and to start think about questions of history itself. Can I see the third, the, the third image, please? The third history, the third image continues this discussion about um, history, but it is now uh, up emerging of what I, of the aesthetics of marvelous realism with, uh, with, with history. And this is work by a contemporary Haitian, his, um, Haitian artist, Edward Duval Carrier, somebody who I worked with and who I've, um, who I've written, um, written about and interviewed and who, are, who I've curated, I've curated his work in a couple of places in, uh, in Miami and um, should have curated his work in an exhibition in South Africa. But um, we got COVID and we could, you know, we are COVIDized. Um, we didn't have COVID, but we, COVID conditions did not allow this. The title of this piece is um, Memories Without History. And in this particular piece, it's a, you know, it's six pieces, um, uh, all stitched together, uh, put together, it's uh, six huge panels of, uh, of aluminum. Um, is that it is he he tell he tries to tell the story of Haiti, and it is interesting what he is what he, what he's doing here. Um, if you look um, to my right, which is then probably to your left, you would see the figure of Toussaint Louverture, who is extremely important in Haitian uh, in Haitian history and in Haitian uh, the Haitian symbolic order as uh, the, the person who led the revolution and who people always call back upon to, um, to, to quote unquote, rescue the country. So um, what you see is the, up to the uppermost um, left, uh, the palm trees of Haiti, which is a, a, a part of the symbolic, um, uh, part of the symbol of the Haitian flag. Um, then further down, you see the, uh, the generals, um, which then talks about the militarization and the, um, the, 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 the elite that has uh, plundered, um, uh, plundered Haiti. Um, then in the middle of it, um, you know, we have, uh, we have uh, the figure of La Serene, um, uh, you know, with uh, really thinking about the, the burning of a particular um, of chapel, that a very important uh, chapel in, uh, in, 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 in Haiti. And that, that, that kind of mixture, that, 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 the juxtaposition of that. And then the, the piece beside that is all the laws um, essentially fleeing Haiti. And um, because one of the arguments he makes um, generally in his work is that the, um, the Haitian migrants come to the United States, not just as, not as empty tabla rasa, but they come carrying with them the laws. And so he, this is the, you know, this he has the laws coming uh, and, they're, and they're coming to um, they're coming to uh, they're coming to to the United States, and they um, the top my top right hand again you have the laws um, and uh, with the the law of Damara um, in the figure of a serpent and uh, and and the Haitian uh, palm tree in the middle there as again people they, they are traveling. What I'm not sure of is um, where where that where the travel in the writers. He has a he has a whole set of paintings about the laws and the and uh, and in slave ships, um, which I think are also fascinating. And then he ends with, um, you know, with uh, Tucson and the difficulty of Tucson on his horse uh, trying to rescue, um, rescue Haiti. And and this is a kind of memory that he has, um, but it is a, a, but what he wants to argue, I think, is that there are all these memories. Of you know of, of, of spirits of, of um, you know flags of independence the the memories of the generals and the and the and the elite and there's a memory of Toussaint Louverture but that there is no particular um, way that he kind of just juxtapose memory to history 
In his later work, on, um, which we will not, which we will not show on, in, in this talk, he, he continues to think about history. And for him, unlike Oban, he wants to develop what he called, what I have called in my description of his work, a, a form of art as living history. In other words, he's trying to think about the ways in which history and memory would have shaped uh, work together to shape Haitian society today. But he wants to then argue, I think, and I use the word argue um, very deliberately. He wants to then argue in, the, in, his, in his artwork that the, that the history is not as something of the past, that the ways in which the Haitian society is constructed is through what I have called um, living history. In other words, what is the point I'm making? And as living history, I have argued, it becomes a critique of the present. So history, therefore, is not just about contextualization. It's not just a certain kind of synthesis of, of, of research. I would argue that Oban, that Duval Carey and Perry, and Perry and Andre Pierre poses questions of history for us. Of what is the, what is the past and how does the past operate? And how is the past? Is it just a collection of stories or questions of narratives? Um, do the laws themselves have no particular uh, purpose? Exactly how can we think about the work of history in Haiti? And how can we think about the work of history as, in, as illuminated and as discussed, I think, and argued fiercely in, um, in, 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 Haitian, in Haitian art? In other words, this is, these are not, Paintings and I would argue Haitian, um, you know, Haitian uh, relationships in the artwork, the history is that there's not a, some people, critics have called a historical, how historical school. So Ban belongs to that and um, Pierre and obviously, um, you know, Duval Carey might belong to this, but that rather what you are looking at is a play on history itself and questions of memory. And through, put through the symbolic order of voodoo in some senses, then not through that, through popular figures. And then in the work of the Valkyrie, you really get the symbolic order of voodoo and a certain baroqueness, which he draws from, from Mexican, from his own fascination with Mexican art in trying to think through this question of history itself. And that what he's there, both, all three of them are trying to do is to establish you now a different archive of Haiti about the idea of, of Haiti itself, which we need to pay attention to. So history, I would argue, is explained through the marvelous way. I would also then want to suggest that the question of politics is also um, examined through this marvelous way. That the politics of Haiti is complex from the revolution, to the, the, the divisions between the Haitian state and the Haitian nation. The way in which Michel Rolf Julio, the Haitian intellectual, late Haitian intellectual argued, the state and the nation were launched in different directions. Politics in Haiti, I would argue, operates at many levels. There's, that, there's an operation of the state with its history of authoritarianism, and there's a, there, there's a way in which it attempts to define certain subjectivities. But what is importantly, I would want to argue, is that there's a politics of, of which exists also in the popular art. And that popular, that politics circles around history and narrative, but also begins to involve, also talks about a critique, a critique of the present. Marvelous realism, I would then end here by saying that this becomes a category that reframes Haitian art, that it is an aesthetic category in itself, that it has an aesthetic category and regime, it actually frames the history and politics of Haitian art. This question of aesthetics of the marvelous realism in Haitian art does not circle around beauty in the ways that we may conventionally understand the questions of aesthetics particularly through Kant. It is found rather in the making of the object. It is found in its relationship to the lived experiences of Haiti, both its history and politics, 
and it tries to wrestle with both understanding the living history as well as politics. This kind of aesthetic regime does not negate beauty, but I would argue locates it elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tony, for that really deep and um, complex paper. Um, I can't wait to hear what James has, has got to say about this in his response. So I'm gonna hand over to James Trafford now. Thank you so much, James. Um, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Amanda, for inviting me to respond. It's such a, a, a delight um, to be in conversation um, with Tony and thanks Tony for that paper. Um, so, because I, because I didn't see the paper in advance, I've, I've kind of woven some thoughts, um, thinking with, with, Win with Sylvia Winter a little bit. I think it works quite well, actually. So I'm hoping that we can maybe draw out some aspects of the conversation um, around particularly thinking about politics and aesthetics, um, and particularly in context of what, what Derek Gregory terms the colonial present and the question of history more, gen gen more generally. Um, so I think what, what, I, what I might do is just give a quick overview of the bits of Sylvia Winter's work that I'm interested in, um, not for Tony's benefit, because I know you're very aware of this work, um, but for others, um, and then come to some questions to, to, to kind of to, to, that might help us to think through some of those. Um, questions about the relationship between politics, art and history and the new and, and things like that. Um, okay, so in, in, in a paper called Rethinking Aesthetics, Sylvia Winter asks, what does aesthetics do? What is its function in human life? What specifically is its function in our present form of life? What correlation does it bear with the social effectivities of our present order, including that into which the real life citizens and captive populations of the US inner cities and the third world shantytown archipelagos are locked. So these questions are carefully positioned within an approach that situates aesthetics in the context of a much broader array of training of sensory experience that also accounts for the relationship between that sensory experience and the normative form of the social. Aesthetics for winter engages with points of power, as she writes, where sensory experience is intertwined with discursive codes. And she, she suggests that um, each mode of the aesthetic is isomorphic with a specific mode of human behavior or form of life. I think that winter's using that phrase differently to the Wittgensteinian tradition um, she's not just meaning here a kind of system of agreed upon meanings or a kind of a mutual kind of attunement which is required um, for shared opinions as, as Wittgenstein is talking about. Um, but she's also interested in, in a kind of state of representation and, and experience and how those are embedded within socio-political and economic contexts. So I think what, what she calls the governing rules of forms of life are a kind of entrenched norms, but that interweave across economic, political and material infrastructures as much as, um, as cultural personality to use um, Amilcar Cabral's phrase. Um, Winter suggests that aesthetics is, is a socio-political practice then that very often involves securing social cohesion and producing a unitary system of meanings. Um, where and where aesthetics might, might function then to reproduce forms of life, its critique often also reifies those underlying metaphysics and hierarchies through performative autonomy and supposed distancing from the codes through which critique is produced. But to decipher rather than critique is Winter's preferred methodological approach, which aims to reveal the systems and codes through which forms of life function. Decipherment helps us to see how the subject themselves are instituted within the replication of our present forms of life. So I think the suggestion here is that the normative 
kind of epistemic and affective world um, that, we, that, we, that we are interested in, in when we're talking about aesthetics does not itself index a kind of reality of the social universe, but something more like that which is formed under condition of the world's existence. So how that social order must be felt in order to consider then how its um, structuring processes are dynam dynamically induced and replicated and, and, and reproduced. Um, I mean, she then, she then, then kind of cre creating a, a, a kind of uh, thinking about the relationship then between decipherment and critique. I think Wendt is interested in thinking about how aesthetic discourse then often intervenes to recuperate and rebalance. So to ensure that the ongoing kind of autopoiesis of the world of the colonial present can keep, can keep reforming dynamically in, in, in new ways, um, but to reproduce itself. I think what's, what's really important with, with Winter's work then is um, the, what we might understand as the codes and rules of um, our forms of life, that the rules of world making um, are not simply things that could be sloughed off. Um, and this, I think this kind of coheres with Winter's development of Fanon's sociogenic principle to indicate how um, universalizations, particularly to specific genres of the human, can't be understood as like as kind of mere fictions. Um, so that so that the genres of the human, as she writes, is, are not simply kind of imperial impositions of a Europe European particular, reified to a universal level that could be like easily kind of written out of the world, but these become intertwined at every layer of existence. But those codes might be written so deeply into the structure of, 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 the, of our forms of life that they suture representation and understanding to the constitution of history. But Winter's move um, through sociogeny, so rejecting the idea of the ontocentric human makes way for the alterability of those most, those most entrenched codes. So where critique might operate as structural reassurance Decipherment, as Zakir Iman Jackson writes, is a praxis that Winter avers catalyzes a transmutation of man as a speaking, knowing, feeling being. So, taking up Fanon's suggestion to reimagine the human in terms of a new history, Winter poses aesthetic invention as that which may become inscribed into new codes of the human, so into new subjects and as rupture within history itself. With this, with these, this kind of thoughts in the background, I'm interested in, in maybe posing a few questions um, or thoughts that you may want to pick up on, um, Tony. So you mentioned, for example, the, how the chasm between politics and aesthetics um, requires bringing together but not collapsing, collapsing into one another. And I think it'd be interesting to, to talk about how how those interconnections and, and different distinct modalities of aesthetics and, and, and politics may, may feed and reinforce and, and, and relate to one another without collapse. Um, and I wonder if, if that relates to this idea of the structure of the new. So this idea of that winter is picking up from Fanon in terms of invention. Um, so the new that can't be inserted into contemporary codes of the human. But then um, David Marriott is, is arguing against, uh, well, with Winter or against Winter, that, um, that she's not adequately, uh, adequately um, engaging with Fanon's invention because uh, for Marriott at least, that the, her, her account of, of, of invention can't be one of rupture and become something more like a kind of re-engineering of the human because it requires that those new codes must be graspable within the continuity of history. So, I want, and I'm thinking that 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 kind of relationship between the new 
um, history and dis the, the continuity and discontinuity of history, perhaps in relation to questions of um, the reproduction, not only of history, but the, the as Winter is talking about the autopoiesis of the, of, of the forms of life, that that maybe is relevant, I hope, to um, some of the questions that you're asking, particularly with the marvelous. So the, the marvelous realism as, as, as potentially um, asking questions as you're putting it of politics and of history of itself. I wonder if, the, if marvelous is a form of invention, if it's a form of rupture, if it's part of the process through which the new subject can be born. Um, and I wonder if there's how how that how that then relates to this this idea of um, historical continuity and discontinuity, and where that kind of lived experience um, uh, account of history kind of becomes interwoven with other histories, um, and then and in so and in which you know in in which ways. Um, does it cohere with those histories and, and in which ways may, might it be a rupture with those histories? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your, your paper. I hope those thoughts are somewhat stimulating. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, James. Um, and again, and my apologies again, the audience should know I'm, I'm, I've been on a plane for the last two weeks and I'm currently in Brazil so to be able to Produce a polished paper which uh, an academic colleague should could read it with difficult. So I'm actually reading from my own notes as I was thinking about the subject. Um, so my apologies. Um, I think that the what I take from that particular essay of Winter is really what work does aesthetics do? So rather than thinking about aesthetics as a, a kind of um, questions of beauty and normative things and around the norms and so on, I interpret it as trying to think about how we can how we can we can work with aesthetics as a form of puncturing the codes that we have. That's how, so, so what work does it do? Um, and so therefore it is not circling around the conventional aesthetic questions at all. Um, <clears throat> and it is what I've said actually around questions of the, of the marvelous and trying to link aesthetics and politics and put in history in the mix is then trying to think about the frame of the marvelous real as doing work and what work does it do? But also then to think about not that separate and apart from an analysis of what the artwork itself is doing. And that's and you know, and we can interpret the artwork in different ways, obviously. But what is it that the artwork is doing? What, what questions are they, is the artwork raising? which are outside of the normative on our the, the, the naturalized understanding of certain sets of questions in Haiti itself. And uh, from that particular perspective, I'm also trying to think about how, you know, in, in, when you have a situation, and this is one of the differences I think I have with uh, Sylvia, when you have a situation where history has been catastrophic, and I use that word deliberately, then what is produced? In other words, how then do you begin to think through that catastrophe? Um, and the, for me, the centrality of Haiti to my own work is that at the revolution level, level of revolution, you have people a revolution that is trying to think about that catastrophe, work through it, and work through it through practice. And then that, and, and that unfolds, right? It, it is about trying to take a new beginnings and develop a set of practices around that. But at the level of art, which has a 19th century formation, which we can talk about, formal formation, 
the school of arts that the revolution actually set up. One of the first things that the revolution does after the revolution is to set up art schools. The first art schools in the, Car in the country, in the Caribbean, are set up right after the revolution. So um, through a friend, through Thomas Clarkson's friend, uh, you know, the, the revolutionary leaders know Clarkson because he's an abolitionist. And they ask this guy whose name I forget now to come to, uh, to, come to Haiti and to train people. And he trains them in portraitures which is really very important because of what then happens at that in the 19th century is the, the first form of major art production is about these portraitures of the revolutionary leaders themselves, right? And not just Toussaint and Dessaline, but also some of the women who participated in, in the revolution. Anyway, my, my, my point is that there is a, that the, 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 the marvelous realism of Stephen Alexis and people like Algier Carpenter um, operates outside of the frames that we know that the West has given us. Um, you know, um, out, operates in ways in which uh, there's a different set of cosmology, there's a different understanding of human life itself. And that that kind of, that, that, and one of the things that one has to do is to, I think as critical intellectual, is to come to grips with that. Let me put it another way, that the, that the, um, the, way, I, the way I put it in the, in the class, that the epiphanies which emerge through a set of practices of people who are thinking and doing. And for me, therefore, the questions of thought is also a question of deed, okay? Um, it's not just thought up in one's head, it's also a, a business of D. Means, quite frankly, that there are sets of practices that open up spaces for us to begin to think through in, what I, in the kind of epiphanies, opening up epiphanies in which there are alternative possibilities. And so that when, for example, just thinking about voodoo, when you shift your focus from say the song, sorry, from the art to the songs. You get an entire history of the Haitian revolution with this various betrayals and so on. And you get an entire critique of the present of the, from the American in, in, invasion to the earthquake to whatever. And that therefore what you are getting is a body of work that is alternative to the ways in which we conventionally think through certain histories of this place. Because my, my argument is that what you then, what you have to find, what you have to understand is that the, uh, the idea of the imperial archive of the zombies, the ways in which, uh, you know, the first zombie film is what? White Zombie, 1931, produced in Haiti. One of the first, one of the, one of, one of the most popular plays on Broadway, it's called what? The Magic Island. It's about Haiti. There, the, there is a, one of the important, important novels at the end of the 19th century in America is what? The novel called The Horrors of Haiti, The Horrors of San Domingue, rather. So that what you are getting is an is a imperial archive. But what you are, all, because the West has to make sure that this place of Black, sub, that has black sub, sovereignty does not succeed. And then what you are then getting are activities and practices from below that then begin to chip away at this, that begin to puncture this. I want to say that because I am deeply influenced by Sylvia's work, deeply. I mean, you know, I'm editing some volumes of her, writing her intellectual back, I'm deeply influenced by her work. But there is a part of our work which is not known in the United States, and it is a work in Jamaica in which she draws directly from Haiti. Her concepts of indigenization, her concepts of rehumanization and so on, draw directly from the work of So Spoke Uncle and Jean Priest Mars and that moment in the 1920s and 30s. And that quite frankly, when she gets to the United States and Stanford, it loses that particular concrete attention there is no other anti-colonial writer and theorist in my view in the entire Caribbean, Francophone, Anglophone, 
that's speaking Caribbean, who is as important as she is in the 1960s and early 70s, no other. But that by the time she gets to the United States and comes as a second in Stanford, then what then happens is that she is still rich. It is still extraordinary. But there is a certain way in which questions of history, which therefore, in my view, questions of practices and ways of life are lost. And I don't think, therefore, you can think through in a complicated world the quest, these some questions of possibilities and potentiality unless you return to not history as the way that we all think about it, but to think about um, ways of life. And, and this all this comes from my engagement to the ways of life as a set of practices. In other words, if you think that the human is, as she would argue, a set of practices, that the human is practiced, to be human is practice, P-R-A-X-I-S, that's what she says. If you think that, then in my view, what you then have to think about is what are the set of practices that we are humans have engaged in? And if you are thinking through, okay, how can you have a, a different horizons of possibilities? Then to me, you are then have to think about what is it, what are the set of practices that have attempted to make those kind of uh, possibilities? And so, I mean, that's my, my, my response to you then is to, is, to, is to argue that this question of the new is that the new, and here I'm very much, you know, obviously marked, the new is inside the old. The problem is that we sometimes don't see that new because we are looking elsewhere. And we are not looking at, we are not, following, we're not even discerning what she would say, which is to try and think about the how is it that human practices have actually defined it. And define it not in the language that we have said we should, it should be defined, but in define it in a different kind of language, which is why I come back to voodoo. I'm not a practicing, not a religious person at all, at all in any shape or form. But, what, but how do you follow in her? How then do you understand voodoo as what she called a counter simplification symbolic order? How, if to do that means that, okay, I then have to understand the spirits, I then have to understand, um, I then have to understand the, the music, I then have to understand the rituals as a way in which people are then practicing something else, which is why I said it's also a system of thought. And that idea is not new, actually, so it, you know, I follow, I follow Joan Diane. Um, remarkable uh, work um, on 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 that on, on that on, on that subject. I mean, so that's my response um, to you. And to then think about the aesthetics and the politics. All I mean, put it very simply. I would argue that the practices of aesthetics and the, are linked to the are linked to the processes of making itself. Uh, to, not to the art object itself and the study of it as beauty, but actually to the art of to the of, to the making of that object. I would then want to suggest that practices of politics, and here I'm following Rance here, obviously, to a bit, is, is around this business of making life in common, uh, of, 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 of a certain kind of experimentation of understanding how to how to make life in common that will be with questions of equality, dignity, exploitation, domination, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We can go through all, we can go through all of, all of, the, all of the difficulties, environmental things and so on and so forth. But at the heart of these things are making, is doing. But to understand that the doing and the deed are also practices of thought themselves, right? Which upends quite frankly the way in which Plato, it, it upends a lot of the ways in which we think about philosophy and theory. But just to think through that doing as, uh, as, 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 um, as, as ways in which we make life possible, the ways in, uh, in, which, we, in which the distribution of life to, is, is not just a distribution of the sensible in the Arantian way, but a distribution of life that reorganize the possibilities of us living in difference, but also living in common. And to me, that's politics. And so the aesthetics to me is about, it both have a practice, practice of making. 
So I don't want to collapse politics into aesthetics, but I would want to argue that there is a commonality of in relationship to the business of making and, 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 the, and, and, the, and, and, and what I would like to call the enactment of life in the same way there's a kind of enactment that is necessary if you are doing a, a piece of artwork. Um, so, all right, let me stop there because I, I could on and on about some other things. Thank, that, yeah, about thank you, Tony, and thanks, James, for the um, response. And thank you very much. And again, apologies for that. Uh, I just, I just want to, um, before I give James a chance to say anything, we've only got like like four minutes left, but I do want to get yeah, a question okay. from the audience. Uh, so, okay, so yeah. if you don't mind, um, and I put it in the chat as well in case you want to read it. It's from John Cousins, mm -hmm. and he says, "Thanks, Tony." I wonder how you would place artist resistance in terms of your framing of Haitian art as operating between aesthetics and politics, uh, the politics of the popular and marvelous realism. So between aesthetics and politics, and then between populars, populism and marvelous realism within this particular uh, group. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, it, I mean, thank you very much for that question. They are, they, they are a remarkable group as, the, as they, um, as they. As the the the, the um, person puts the question in the um, in the in chat knows, they have an idea that the museum is bourgeois. Um, they in the in the in, in the bourgeois institution, in the middle of um, of Haitian Port-au-Prince, um, quote unquote slum, they attempt to create a an experimental, in my view, um, uh, both art as well as um, uh, exhibitionary, do exhibitionary practices um, just for the audience. They have also been shown, they were recently shown about them right before COVID. They were in my in the Miami Art Museum. Their, their work was um, shown, edited, not edited, curated by mm -hmm. Edward de Valcari and, um, and, and one other person. I think that they work, for me, the politics of them, of politics of artist assistance is actually an expression of the politics of the marvelous real and direct expression of it. In other words, there is no, there is no mediation um, in, 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 their, in their work. They draw from the voodoo symbology that, uh, that I've spoken about. They, um, they are harsh in their particular political criticisms of, of Haiti and of the world. Um, their experimentation with, um, with, with, with material um, you know, is, is, is extraordinary. Some of which were not allowed in the United States for the show that, the first show that they did in New York. Um, and uh, so for me there, and so for me there are, the, the marvelous realism is, is and really an expression of a certain kind of popular art. This is what I would argue. And that, I mean, I would want to take the position of Edward Blissant on this, that one of the things about um, Haitian art is that in the same way there is a certain kind of orality in the Caribbean, that there's a certain kind of popular imagination that expresses itself through its art, its, its art form. In the very same way, there's a kind of musical imagination that expresses itself at the popular in say, places like Jamaica that creates reggae um, and dance on. That in Haiti, it is that, that what, is be, what is created is a form of popular art that is linked to this business of marvelous realism. And that, and that artist resistance is, is, is quintessential that. Thank you so much. Sort of we are kind of just getting over time, but I just want to give, um, if you wanted to, just a small window of opportunity, because I just make, want to make sure that you've, you've kind of set, had your kind of say, but James, would you like to say anything just to finish up? Um, before we close for today, and then I'll turn to Tony. But I just want to give you the opportunity. Yeah, thank. I mean, I'm not sure what I can say so quickly, but I think <laughs> I mean it's. I, I'd love to talk for longer about about um, what you're saying. I think, and I think there's some, there's something really interesting. I mean, I mean, the immediate question that I have is like that: if 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 everything is reducible to pragmatics, then how is how where is the puncturing of the codes? Like, how is that possible, right? Like, how is how like how is how is the pragmatism and praxis related to those moments of rupture? And I guess then maybe the question is simply that um, you think that pragmatics are kind of overcoded 
by aesthetics or by um, critique or, or like over-determined, like as, as Winter was saying. Um, no, I'm gonna, of, I'm gonna, yeah, no, no, go, go, go ahead. No, I, you say I wouldn't use the word pragmatics because I don't think the kind of praxis I'm talking about is not pragmatics. Okay. The kind of praxis and practice I'm talking about is, is, is actually a practice that punctures. If you think about a Buddha practice, for example, it actually it is a puncturing of the cosmology of the West. Um, that's not that's not practical, pragmatic. If you think about the work of uh, Andre Peer, is a is a pragmatic. You know, I mean, Andre Breton was right. Hippolyte's work is a puncturing of the form of of of, of the art form. So, so what I want to do, I mean, there are obviously there are everyday practices that are pragmatic. Obviously, one cannot deny that. But I also want to point to practices that actually puncture and, and have a, and, 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 and are not necessarily repeatable. This is the other thing. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily repeatable because they because they because you you don't every single day and I keep, you know, get up in the morning and say, okay, I'm going to puncture. It's hard work, right? And have lives to live and et cetera, et cetera. Right? And, and, and families to feed and so on and so forth. But what you get are these particular ways in which moments in which those practices actually puncture the puncture to use winter's word, the codes, puncture the dominant codes itself. Um, we as critical intellectuals, in my view, then need to actually understand that and to begin to theorize around that, um, you know, as, 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 as the possibilities for potential on different horizons. Without saying that this is, we can bring it into being because the bringing into being is not us. The bringing into being is, a, is another set of processes. Okay, well, thank you so much for that response. And I, I know we've, we've got so much to talk about. I had pages of my own questions as well for um, maybe another time. I feel like it's just the beginning of this discussion sincerely. Um, I just wanna thank James for being the respondent, for taking your time to be with us today in your time zone. And I wanna thank Tony for coming from his time zone in, in Rio uh, to be with us today when I know you're very busy um, with work out there. And also thanks to the audience for listening, for your questions. Um, and I hope that we can continue these kind of debates in the future, um, in the fall, there'll be a new lecture series again. Um, I'm looking forward to that. So I wanna thank everybody who's been with us for the semester. And again, for our technical support people and all the staff who've made it possible. So thank you very much and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Beach, and thank you, James. Yeah, thank you thank so much. You. Thank you so much. Um, I did have um, a whole lot of questions <laughs> as well. And I just want to say that what, I don't expect you to answer this. Um, I think we should be going off live.